Hey there viewers and welcome back to Grumpy Monkey Garage where you've probably been redirected here from your potential supervisor or place of employment because I'm going to be going over the basics of what I think you should know starting out in the automotive industry so that we can establish a baseline of stupid because right now when you go to hire people in this industry especially on the low end for lube tax and things like that we'll go over those tiers in this video as well but uh, we get varying degrees of knowledge so I think having a video that establishes a baseline of what I think you should know going in would assist in that and help your career advance faster than as if you started not knowing anything and some master tech had to take the time to teach you all the things that I'm just gonna kind of briefly explain in this video. So that's the purpose. Hopefully you learned something or you find this video helpful. If you take on an apprentice in your future, you can just send them this video and say, this is what you should know before you come to work tomorrow type of scenario. So we'll keep it quick, we'll keep it simple, and we'll stick to the basics. Let's get started. So when you first start working on cars, you must be able to identify what the hell is a car. So I've brought you uh, one of my project Corollas that we like to save on this channel. And uh, this is a 2002 Toyota Corolla and it's a sedan. Now this is not a sedan, this is a sedan. So this would be a car, this would be a truck. You know that sounds really stupid proof, but there's people out there who don't know the difference. Um, we're going to start on this. So when somebody brings a car to the shop, they're going to hand you keys. This is a key. This is a key. If you just get this, this is a fob. This is not a key. This is a fob. So on the paperwork, if they have a little X, whatever, at the dealership that says keys received or fob received, you just got the fob. And yes, this happens a lot where you'll just get the fob and the key is a wall. They'll give the tow truck driver the ability to get in. They'll get towed in and they'll, you know, keep the keys because they got to get into their house. So they'll keep all the keys, including the one that starts the car, which won't do you any good. So fob is the part with the buttons that say lock and unlock. Key is the actual thing you're gonna stick in the ignition to start the car. Key, fob. Now some, like Toyotas, the newer Toyotas will actually have a key fob, which is both, where you've got your buttons on your key. That's a key fob, because it's both. If you have a set like this, technically somebody might call this a key fob, but this is a key and a fob. I'm not a locksmith, I don't know the technical differences inside of them, but that's the terminology for you. Now a sedan. We're gonna just transit right into this. Transit, by the way, terrible car, video of its own. A uh, sedan is classified as a car that has four doors and it's a passenger vehicle. So sedan is gonna have four doors like this one does and uh, it's a passenger vehicle. It's not a utility van, it's not a pickup truck, it's none of those things, it's just a passenger car. That's, that's it, that's all that defines a sedan. You can have a sport sedan, they put a spoiler on the back, put a fancy engine in it, Acura does a lot of sport sedans. Not that they're bad, it's just, that's a different thing. I like Corollas, cause you know, I like good gas mileage and not having to fix things. As you saw, this one here's got plenty of pine straw on it, cause I basically just leave it behind the shop until I'm doing a video like this. Um, and we'll go over the parts of the car now. All right, so starting with the parts of a car, if you're not going to a body shop, you don't need to know all of this, but you should know the terminology in general. Everything in blue on the side of this car here is a fender, because we've replaced it with one that's not factory, that's why it's blue. So that's the fender. Fender's on the side of the car. You might have rear fenders as well, but on a lot of newer cars, they're called quarter panels when they're back there. But they're just the side piece between the door and the bumper. Speaking of, that's a door. If you didn't know that, maybe you need to not work in this career. This is the hood. The hood is the front part of the car that covers your engine on every single car. Um, they're usually up front. Uh, there are cars like the Volkswagen where the engine's in the back. That's an exception to the rule. So for the most part, they're up here under the hood. Uh, the bumper is the thing that you bump shit into. So uh, if you've got a family member like I do who likes to wreck into everything, you will find you're replacing a lot of bumpers. 
Uh, headlight is the part that turns on when you turn the headlights on. That was pretty stupid proof, wasn't it? Uh, the side lights over here with the amber lights are called marker lights. People call them blinkers, turn signals. They're all correct. Nobody's wrong, but they're marker lights. If you go to the parts catalog and you're looking for this part, it's called a marker light. That's what it's called. Moving to the center of the vehicle here, we've got a grill. The grill is the shiny part, the part that, think about this, if the car was smiling, that's what that is. And then your headlights would be the eyes almost. You see these people, they put like eyelashes on their car. That's kind of what they're doing here. But the grill is the front, usually has the emblem. I'd say probably 90% of the time the emblem is actually on the grill. Sometimes it's centered on the hood. Some of the older Hondas were like that. But that's the side. All it is is a decoration, but it should have slats in it to let air flow into the engine. We'll get to that later. Uh, on to the back of the car. Let's go back there. Coming to the rear of the car, you've got a trunk on a sedan. They should all have trunks. Some vehicles are called hatchbacks. They'll have a hatch. Again, we'll get to that later. This is a trunk. You've got tail lights, brake lights, and marker lights again on the rear so that people behind you can see where you're going and if you're stopping or not. Should have three visible if you don't have a pine forest on your car. You got a rear bumper. That's the thing people hit when they rear end you and you've got a trunk lid. Some of them are fancy now, mine is not. Mine has the old school where you open it up to get inside of it. That would be inside the trunk. So if somebody sends you a car on a rollback wrecker and they say, oh yeah, the part that fell off is in the trunk. This is where you'll go look. And yes, if you already knew that and you're like, wow, people don't know that. Yeah, they don't know that. All right, now this is an engine. This is actually a Corolla engine that came out of that Corolla I just showed you five seconds ago. Um, I decided to show you parts of the engine without the rest of the car around it to avoid confusion. This is an engine. All an engine does is become, well, it is a rotating assembly and all it does is generate power. That's it. It does not drive the car. That's what a transmission does. We're not getting into that in this video. That's all this does. An engine can be identified. Transmissions, as general rule, don't have pulleys. So when you open your hood and you're like, where's the engine? You'll find a bunch of pulleys that have a belt on them. And when you see that, that's the engine side. It's gonna have exhaust on one side, intake on the other, sometimes on the same side. Nobody cares, but they're there. From the top down, we got parts of the engine. Valve covers at the very top on an overhead cam engine. Even if it's not overhead cam, they're usually valve covers. And you have a head. The head includes the valves and uh, spark plugs, fuel injectors, all that stuff's gonna go into the head somewhere. And you have your block. Your block is gonna contain your pistons and your rings and your cylinders. All that stuff's in here. These show offs ruined in my videos. Uh, we got the uh, oil pan is at the bottom. That's where all your oil is going to be. And if you're new to a shop, you're probably going to be doing oil changes in tires. So let's get into that a little bit. At the bottom of every oil pan ever, there is a drain plug. It's literally a bolt with nothing attached. All the rest of these bolts are going to something. This bolt's going to nothing. That's how you'll identify the drain bolt. You'll remove it. Oil will come out. You wait for the oil to stop coming out. You put the bolt back in. You put new oil in. It's done. There's a filter involved. We'll show that on the other side of the engine when the camera's over there. Moving on to tires. If you're changing tires, tires are the rubber part of the wheel assembly. So if you look at my trailer tire there, the center silver part of that tire hub wheel assembly there is the rim. You have a rim and you have a tire. So here is a tire without a rim in it to demonstrate that they are two separate pieces. Yes, there are people who did not know they were two separate pieces. So I'm explaining it. Tire tread. Don't be looking at the side of a tire trying to see how much tread is on it. You look at it from the cross. So if you're on a car, you might have to turn the steering wheel to be able to see the tread. The tread, there's a quarter trick, a penny trick. I don't care what shop you're at. They'll all teach you a different manner. Some of them have special tools to tell you the tread depth. When it's completely flat, that's called bald. That's a severely bad tire. That's for any shop ever. If it's completely with no tread, it's either a drag racing tire or it's completely bad. All right, so let's move on to the other side of the engine. We'll show you what we need to over there. This is an oil filter. You spin it off, it spins off to the left, it spins on to the right. You'll change that when you change oil as well. That's all you really need to care about on this side of the engine for now. Moving up a class of vehicle from sedans, which were the four-door cars, I've got SUVs. Now behind me is a class called large SUV. In fact, this is the biggest SUV that's gasoline-based that you can buy, the Suburban. Uh, it's pretty American. And Anybody overseas isn't going to know what I'm talking about, but I mean, I guess this doesn't really apply to you then. The uh, SUVs are most popular in the United States. They're classified by being a truck-based chassis. They file under emissions compliance for trucks, which is nice. 
and they, uh, they tend to be easier to work on in my opinion because they got a whole lot more heavy duty, a whole lot more room to work, it's just easier. But this is an SUV. All right, now the difference between the trucks, SUV and pickup truck, is if you have some nasty cargo you don't want to smell, you can make the guy behind you smell it in a pickup truck by putting it in the open bed. That's the difference in classification. The SUV, it's covered back here. Pickup truck, it's open. You can just reach in and move stuff and there's no obstruction. Obviously, this is a security hazard if you live around meth heads like I do. You need to keep stuff locked up back here or not keep stuff back here is what I do. Okay, class, if you made it this far, that's pretty good because everything we've gone over so far is pretty basic. This is where we're gonna get into some intermediate basic stuff. And uh, we're gonna go over basic classifications of tools. Now, obviously this isn't an in-depth analysis. It's also not any kind of, I'm not telling you these are the tools you have to have, best tools. Not what I'm telling you, just what they are, what they do, and you should be familiar with the terminology. You'd be surprised how many apprentices come in here, particularly in automotive school, don't know the difference between screwdriver, wrench, ratchet, they don't know those things. So that's what I'm going over right now. All right, so let's just start. These are wrenches. These are the only three wrenches here. Nothing else is a wrench, just these three. You have an adjustable wrench because it's, you know, adjustable that would make it an adjustable wrench you have a box wrench now what a box wrench is is you have an open fork end and you have a boxed end so if you're on a nut and you don't want to slip off and you got contact all the way around you can really give it the beans there and get that nut off so that's a box wrench it looks like this a variant of box wrenches is the ratcheting box wrench now what this means is you've got your regular fork in but you don't have to take the wrench off, move it, put it back, and move it again. You can just keep it on the bolt and keep turning it until it comes completely off, or the nut, whatever. Next, we've got different kinds of pliers. So you've got needle nose pliers, which obviously have the pointy boys ready to go. That's good. You've got slip jaw pliers, which are, you know, regular pliers, but they can expand to be bigger. These work great on hose clamps, so that's something to uh, think about. And you have a locking pliers, most popularly called vice grips, because most of the ones out there are vice grips. Um, mine's actually vice grip brand, but what that means is if you lock down on something, you can tighten this screw and get tighter on it, and it will actually stay locked on there so it won't slip off for you. So this is a very useful tool as well. Next, we got our screwdrivers, or if you're a crazy lunatic, pry drivers, because screwdrivers do get used for prying a lot. Your two most common are gonna be your Phillips head, which has almost like a plus sign on top. We'll show you a close up of this just now. And your flat head. Now your flat head obviously has a flat head. You know, this is for what we would use as a pry driver. If you need to get a plastic trim piece off, you might use this to pry on. You might actually have something you need to unscrew with it, but the flat head screwdriver gets used for a variety of different uses, separate video on its own. I don't know if that'd be a very entertaining video. You'll have to tell us in the comments. Other things I would classify along the screwdriver category, at least it goes on the same magnet strip here in my shop, is a trim tool remover. All your plastic clips and things you can be removing with this. There's many different variants of trim tools. I have about 37 different types, but this is just one of the basic ones that you should know what it looks like. Next we have the pick. Now the pick is not something you're gonna torture a, uh, your girlfriend in the basement with. This is a, uh, something you're gonna use to get air conditioning O-rings out. Um, if you've got a bolt you dropped and you need to reach it, this is the right angle to get in there and pull it out where you can get it. You can also use a magnet for that. Um, this is just a general all around helpful tool. I can't even list all the times we've needed a pick just to do something simple. Um, and sometimes you just can't get your meat hooks in there. You will need the a, uh, you know, medieval torture device here, the pick. Next, we're gonna get into ratchets. Now ratchets, are not wrenches, but they are called ratcheting wrenches in some circles. Not that they're wrong, but this is a ratchet. If somebody asks for a ratchet, this is what they're asking for. Not a box wrench, they're asking for a ratchet. Now a ratchet has teeth inside the head, so you can only turn one way. So if you're tightening or loosening something, this controls that, which direction you're going. And uh, you can attach many different sizes of sockets. This is called a socket. This is not a nut. Actually, I had an apprentice thought these were nuts. No, this is a socket. 
Socket can be six point or 12 point inside, sometimes uh, e-torques and things like that. Again, getting complicated, so we'll keep it basic. Put the socket on the ratchet. You can spin on or off a bolt. So that's what you'll use this for. Um, sometimes if you can't reach all the way down into where you're reaching, you'll need an extension. You can basically extend your socket out that far to get down in somewhere to get that nut or bolt off. So that's the extension, socket, ratchet. I'm hanging up some terms. Next, we got the pry bar. Now, there's lots of different pry bars. Crow bars could be considered pry bars, but an automotive pry bar generally has the handle down here and you've got some sort of bend on the top so you can get in there and pry a transmission away from an engine or pry a brake caliper off that's seized. Whatever you're doing, this is literally just for sticking places and moving stuff. That's what they're for. Do not buy the cheapest junk pry bars you can because sometimes you have to trust your life to these things where you're pushing on something and if it slips off or breaks, you're gonna get impaled or stabbed or crushed. Don't buy the cheap ones. You have to trust your life to these, get good quality ones. Uh, next, I guess we can go into the funnel. A funnel is a device that allows you to not spill all over my flipping floor and make me really mad at you when you work here. Uh, so this is a device you put in the engine and pour into this, not all over the floor. Story time later on that. Next up is the hammer segment. Now there's a bunch of different hammers. This is a mallet because it's rubber. A rubber mallet, it's also a dead blow. It's got sand in the head. It sounds like a maraca, you know, you can have a party with that. Um, but this is great for hitting stuff that you don't want the hammer. When it hits, it stops. It doesn't hit and bounce back like a metal one will. So that's a mallet. This is a mini sludge, but there's lots of different kinds of metal hammers and things. Um, you really need a good quality hammer in here. So when I ask for a hammer, I'm asking for this. If I ask for a mallet, I'm asking for this. If the master tech says a dead blow, I actually knew a guy who specifically called these dead blows. This is also that, but there are mallets that aren't dead blows. So that one gets a little more complicated. It really needs its own segment. We're not gonna get too far into it. Hammer, mallet, general rule. Next, we have impacts. Now, impacts are the big ugga duggas you see us taking wheels off with. We've got separate videos reviewing my impact and how much I liked it. This is the air driven variant of an impact. There's also battery powers, but uh, what you'll look for is it has a chuck on the end that can accept the socket so you can give something to beans. Now that you saw how much fun the impact was, we also have electric ratchets. Maybe you can't fit the giant impact in somewhere, you're on flat rate, you don't really have time to sit there and fool with that bolt. You can zip it out with the air ratchet that's gonna make your life a little faster as well. So air ratchet and air impact, things you should uh, know what they're called. Now last but not least, shop lights. We have our, we actually have a shop light review up and I can't find a good one because every single shop light you ever buy is a pile of shit. So that's a piece of junk. Here's the Braun, we like that pretty good. But ironically, after we made that video, talking about how good the Braun was, one of my Braun lights actually died, so that was frustrating. But this is a shop light. I don't mean this. When I ask you to pass me the light, don't go turn on and off the light switch thinking you're gonna give me light. I, this is what I want. This is the light I want you to pass me. Not that. that. I don't know why that was confusing. That's why we're doing this video. All right, class, we're gonna go over three big pieces of equipment in the shop. Number one is the jack. The jack is identified as being the big rolly boy that lifts things up in the air. When you move the handle, it goes up. Now to make it go up, if it's not going up when you're pulling the handle, you have to twist the handle here to the right. That makes it go up. To make it go down, you'll twist it to the left and the jack will fall. Now don't ever twist it to the point that the entire car falls on the ground and makes a loud thud and breaks my concrete to the point I wanna go break your face. Put it down gently. Now, along with a jack, you'll also need to use a jack stand. Jack stands are here, they're great. You can put the car on them. It's a little more stable than something that's hydraulically operated. It's mechanically operated, it's a little bit safer. So that's what you're gonna use with that. That's what these are, jack, jack stand. Jack's big rolly boy, jack stand is just one piece of metal mechanical unit. The next thing I'm gonna identify is this is a toolbox. A tool cart and a toolbox are different things. I don't have a tool cart here right now. We'll put you a picture up of one. That's a tool cart, this is a toolbox. Toolbox means it has drawers with stuff in it. Now if you come over here and look at my toolbox, you'll see that everything is organized in here. All my sockets are where they belong, everything's labeled, I got my picks in the corner, my extensions. It's not an absolute wreck. 
If you get into an automotive shop, particularly a dealership, and you're getting your first tool set, your first toolbox, and it looks like somebody threw a fragmentation grenade in there and just, oh, there's just stuff in there. You're never gonna find anything and you're not setting yourself up for success. That being said, I do know technicians who've been in the business for 30 years who looks like a tornado runs through their toolbox every afternoon and they can never find anything, but they've been technicians for a long time. I prefer you keep it clean and organized to save you time on flat rate. Next. These are drain pans. This one's for oil, this one's for coolant. The one with the big spout is used for coolant. That's all, next. Everything is generally labeled except the oil isn't as clear as everything else. For instance, we have oil, coolant, power steering fluid, which hopefully you're literate and can read that it's power steering fluid, and automatic transmission fluid. Now, the oils, the petroleum-based stuff, which is these three, this stuff is oil-based. You can throw that in the waste bin, that's totally okay. Coolant, sometimes you have to keep it separate. In some locations, you have to dispose of it properly, recycle it, yada, yada. Um, here, we have to do that as well, so we have to recycle it. Um, but these three are in similar bottles, so these are the three that get confused a lot. Oil is always gonna say some sort of SAE approved rating, which is gonna be your flow rate, your viscosity, as it were. So 5W30, 10W30, 5W20, whatever. That's what engine oil is gonna have on it. Power steering fluid will be labeled power steering fluid. There's really not anything else you need to know about that. Transmission fluid will be labeled transmission fluid. Coolant comes in gallons. It also comes in giant vats, but if you work at a fancy shop with giant vats, everybody has a different system. You'll have to learn their system. Most of the rest of us shops who aren't bazillionaires, uh, we sell it in gallons. So by the gallon, you got a gallon size bottle, more than likely it is coolant. It will also say on there, antifreeze coolant. Coolant is the unique fluid in the automotive world and the fact that you have to cut it with water. So it's actually just antifreeze until you mix it with water, then it's called coolant. And that's the difference. That's our basics on fluids. All right, the last thing I wanna talk about today is the pay structure in automotive. You could get on three different kinds of pay, flat rate, hourly, and salary. Nobody ever does salary, at least where we live, so we're not gonna talk about that one. Hourly is if you work five or six hours a day, or eight hours a day if you're getting hired full-time, you're gonna get paid for those hours. Flat rate doesn't work like that. Flat rate works, you get paid by the job. So an oil change, for example, might pay 0.5 of an hour. That's half an hour, 30 minutes. If you get that oil change done in 15 minutes, you still get the whole half hour of pay, which is great. Because if you knock out oil changes all day long and just waste them, you might get up to 16 hours of pay in an eight hour workday. And that's awesome. That's great stuff. Or even more if the math works out in your favor like that, depending on what you got coming in and out of your shop. The other reason flat rate is used a lot is because it rewards productive, efficient technicians, and it does not reward people who aren't working as hard. However, it can, you can still get burned by flat rate even if you are good at working. I'll give you an example. If the car comes in, it's an old rusty POS, every single bolt is breaking and you're having to tap and die them out and it's just an awful time, the flat rate for that job might be five hours and it might take you two days, maybe even a week in sometimes. Because of that, flat rate balances itself out. So I here's an example. We did a Camry brake job the other day. All four wheels, we were doing pads and rotors. So pads and rotors per axle pays 1.5. So for the front and the rear, it's 1.5. This technician had that knocked out in 40 minutes. So he got three hours of pay in 40 minutes. And that's amazing. That's how you do well in this industry is by being efficient. He had all the tools. He knew all the sizes for a Camry. He's only been working with us for about six months and he's already that good. That's how good you wanna be. So with that in mind, those are the different pay structures. That's how that works. So if you're applying for a job and it's an hourly or flat rate position, now you know. Um, hopefully you learned something from this video and you can be on that baseline so you know what you're talking about when you go into that interview. When they offer you $15 an hour but it's flat rate and you don't really know what you're doing all the way, you're not gonna make $15 an hour because you're gonna be slow. You're not gonna make that. If it's an hourly position, it probably pays lower and it also varies from region to region. So some regions will be higher for the same job than other regions, so take that as well. Well, that's all we've got today for Grumpy Monkey Garage. We hope you enjoyed our video and be sure to like and subscribe. Watch some of our reviews and updates and things like that. And if you want more information about running a shop, watch our Grump of the Week 
where we talk about things that have frustrated us that week in automotive. See y'all next time.